All right, we are live. We'll give a minute for people to file in. You know how Zoom is. How are you doing today, Dave? Doing good. Wednesday. Looking forward to uh, getting through half the week. Happy hump day. Yep. What is going on with this cold spell down in South Florida? It's been like our coldest winter ever. Rainy and like waking up in the 50s. It's uh, terrible. I've been opening all the windows. It's rather nice. I'm enjoying it. Our power bills are low in Florida for the first time. <laughs> first time in years. Yeah. So welcome, everyone. Uh, we're just letting people get in. Once I see those numbers start dying off, we will get started. And I think uh, now's the time. So hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is our webcast for a portion of Security 565, Red Team Operations and Adversary Emulation. And today I'm joined with Dave. We're gonna be talking about going from pen testing to red team. This is a path that many of us took. Uh, I know Dave and I took this path, so we're gonna cover a lot of stories and also a lot of the necessary requirements that we have to like hey, if we're going to red team a company, we should probably say that we're using a methodology and a framework that's used by large financial organizations and regulators around the world. So we're going to do mostly a breakdown of all of that. Um, you can find me on Twitter at George Archias, and Dave Mayer is also on Twitter. We'll post his handle here on our chat. We have a bunch of screens open. So to answer that question, we're going to get, yes, these slides will be available. And that is very good for you because we're not going to read all these slides. We have like 52 slides to go over in 50 minutes. We're obviously not going to do all that. Um, so the slides will be available. The next question is, is this being recorded? And the answer is, of course, it's being recorded. We will have that recording available for you in your SANS portal. Uh, just give us a little, you know, to download it, chop it up and put it on there. Uh, but it is all being recorded. You will get the slides. Um, you have a Q&A where you can ask uh, ask us questions. We're gonna do a very quick course overview. Again, a lot of these slides are for you to read later. Uh, we're gonna talk about why uh, red teaming. We're gonna talk about frameworks and methodologies, and we're gonna talk about some command and control. And I just realized I did not upload <laughs> update those pages. We do not have over 60 pages. Uh, we only have 52 of them. Uh, I'm George Archias. I'm a SANS Principal Instructor and co-author of Security 565 Red Team Operations and Adversary Emulation. I currently work at Verizon. I'm a Senior Director there running Readiness and Proactive Security, which is a fancy way of saying the offensive team involves enterprise vulnerability management, enterprise pen testing, red teaming, purple teaming, and now a new AI red team. I've done some things for the community, like the Purple Team Exercise Framework, which we'll mention here, C2 Matrix, which many of you probably know, MITRE Attack, Atomic Red Team, CVSS, etc. And I am a soccer fan, also known as football. My favorite team is Real Madrid. <laughs> over to you, Dave. Dave Meyer, uh, just taking over, joining as author now for Sec 565. So I'll be working on getting some updates and getting new things together in the course. Currently, I'm over at Nuvic, founded the company a couple of years ago, and I run our advanced assessments team. So the team doing uh, penetration testing, red teaming, cloud security, uh, and get to work with some awesome people like uh, Moses Frost and Jean Mayes. Uh, it's awesome to work with them. Uh, previously, I was over at Citibank with George uh, a number of years ago, and from there jumped off and started into consulting. Was it in Guardians for a while and then Grimm? Uh, and been able to get my feet into a lot of different environments, being able to play around with a lot of different things and really gave me that experience and where I've been able to push red teaming even further uh, from where I started out years ago. And you have like every single GXer except the one that you will never be able to get. And that is our new GRTP. That is the GX red team practitioner. Shout out to an uh, anonymous attendee who said they passed it just two hours ago. So congrats to you. And again, because Dave's going to be a co-author, authors can't uh, and will not be getting the cert for the classes that they write. So we're going to miss one from this amazing list here, Dave. Um, 
something else that some of you may know, some of you might not know, we have a Discord. Uh, it's a SANS Offensive Operations Discord. I actually have that open right now in the conferences and webinar channel. Uh, of course, we can talk on there. The Discord remains alive after the webcast, unlike the Q&A and the chat, which uh, you're seeing now. So if you want to join that, um, we'll have Randall post the URL there uh, for you to join. It's a great community. If you've taken any of the SANS uh, offensive courses, uh, it's a great place to hang out with alumni as well as to talk shop. So um, very quick, and again, these slides are available for you. I did leave this, the course overview slides. You can find a lot of this in the syllabus for SEC 565, and that is Red Team Operations and Adversary Emulation, where you learn the skills to perform safe professional Red Team operations. We give you some of the repeatable frameworks and methodologies, which is what we're going to focus on on today's webcast. There's a bunch of tips and tricks that we learned the hard way. So we'd share them with you so that you don't suffer the pain uh, that we have gone through. I mean, it's red teaming, so you're still gonna suffer a little bit of pain, right? No pain, no gain. But uh, we give you a ton of tricks and there is a very large range for the first five days and then an entirely different large range for the CTF. So lots of very cool things in the course. It is broken down in six days. The first five days are combination of lecture with labs. And then day six is uh, the CTF. And if you win the CTF, you get a really cool coin. Let me actually get it from my coin holder over here. I should have been prepared, but here we go. Check out this baby. Uh, the camera is not giving it justice, is it? But it is a pretty cool coin. So you get that on day six. Um, SANS also, we teach a bunch of different ways because everyone learns a different way. So of course you have the courseware books, you have the labs, you have the instruct instructors, which have a ton of experience. And apart from text, we also have um, some of these mind maps that you see here. This is just very high level, of course, covering each day what we go through on day one, day two, which is attack infrastructure and operational security. We'll actually give you a couple slides on that today. Day three of getting in and staying in, a lot of mapping to MITRE attack and the cyber kill chain and the unified kill chain. Uh, day four, active directory attacks and lateral movement, action on objectives, and of course, a little bit of reporting, followed by the final day of capture the flag, which is a ton of fun, like I said. So that's a little bit about the course. Again, I know I went through all that fast because we're gonna get to the actual content, is why red team? And this isn't so much about why you wanna be a red teamer. This is more about why your company or your client is going to want to hire you to do a red team. Right. So here we're going to cover the motivations, uh, viewing an org holistically. We're going to biases, testing people and process, not just technology, which is a little bit of a shift from pen testing, testing assumptions, and one of the biggest ones, tr training and improving the blue team. So your your customer changes from a developer, where you know in an app pen test you might find issues in an app that the developer fixes to here trying to build detections and a little bit of focus on stuff. So over to you, Mr. Dave, what is red teaming? Red teaming really is, it came out of the military, but it's taking whatever you're taking a look at and having that adversarial mindset around it of how you're gonna be actually being able to attack it if you're trying to get access to something, taking whatever that real goal is and the objective and being able to execute on it. Uh, for in class, number of different ways that we actually talk about it, we have adversary emulation and adversary simulation. And yes, they are different. They are not the same. Uh, emulating, you're going to be going through trying to be as close as possible to what the adversary is doing uh, and using the same TTPs that they're using while simulation, you're going to be going through and just trying to 
do what they're doing, but not doing it in the same way that they're doing. So you might be doing it completely differently, simulation versus emulation, and they are different. Uh, we'll most likely be doing social engineering as a part of it. So you could be physical in person. Those are always some of the most fun. Uh, going, getting into a building, calling them up on the phone, getting them to visit a site for you or go and download something. Um, and then phishing the most common one, email as well, sending in payloads that way to get in. Uh, so a number of different ways that we really take care of it and view it at that point of actually getting in for a red team and going through that. Uh, and it's not always going to be a tabletop exercise. Sometimes you might have that beforehand during planning and such. Um, but it's going to be something you walk through. You'll be able to test the people as well in those processes, how they're going to actually respond when there's a real threat within the organization uh, and expanding outside of that technical scope to the non-technical people as well, because you may end up going after, say, somebody in human resources for phishing with a resume document that might have a macro in it or something to that effect uh, to get into the org. Yeah, and I think that's like one of the things that we've seen in the industry. It's like, we called it back in the day, right? Vulnerability assessment, vulnerability scanning with your, your tenables and your rapid sevens or whatever tool. And then pen testing focused a lot on technology and then red teaming, what we're covering here. But more and more, I keep hearing red teaming just like as a catch-all phrase, probably because we call blue teaming a, a catch-all phrase, right? You can have your threat hunters, you can have your SOC analysts, you can have your incident response, your forensic aiders. We call them all blue team. That's kind of happening here. But in our focus of this course is focusing on those red team uh, engagements. I'm getting unstable internet. So over to you, Dave. Yes. So what we're going to be doing overall, taking that large picture of the org, what do they look like first from the external? What do they have sitting out there being able to really identify it at that point? Uh, being able to set, set those boundaries as to what you're actually taking a look at and even find other data out there. Maybe there's some cred credential dumps for users uh, that you might be able to go and leverage or get additional information uh, to pull in at that point. And being able to go outside just that physical virtual boundary of the organization, maybe the infrastructure they operate, because you might be able to go and find other things out there in other cloud storage, maybe things previously leaked as well. Uh, and being able to pull a lot of that thing, those things in that may be outside an org's normal mindset of what they're in control of and what's out there. Um, you're also going to be going in and taking a look at some of those biases that are out there. Many times uh, going in and been on red teams where this has happened, where like this can't happen, not going to happen to us. There's no way that it will happen. Uh, trying to put all those biases aside and being able to actually go and do the testing at that point, being able to establish what those objectives are, what the goals are, and then being able to reach them uh, and putting aside, well, we know this isn't going to work, so we're not going to try it. No, you're still going to go through and try it at that point uh, to see if the controls are in place to actually block it. So you really want to test those things overall, whether it's going to be technology that's blocking and maybe there's a process in place. Uh, from an incident response perspective that's going to go and shut down access a certain period of time after something is compromised. Uh, I know sometimes I've come across organizations where if somebody reports a phishing email within 15 minutes, they're re uh, taking a look at that email and pulling it out of everyone's mailbox in the org that received it at that point to be able to go and stop the threat at that point. Uh, and then you're testing those people as well with part of it. Uh, and a lot of those assumptions going through and testing them, you're going to build them in. Maybe you have built out defenses for Hafnium uh, in some cases. Well, you want to go and test them. Make sure that they're all working at that point because you may have an assumption there that it's going to work. You'll be alerted. It's not going to happen, but maybe one specific TTP is blocked, uh, especially when there's sub-techniques out there, but you want to be able to account for everything uh, and not just go what you believe is going to be happening. And obviously, as we were saying earlier, the most important thing is to improve the blue team overall that is what our overall purpose is when we're coming in, is to help make the organization more secure as a whole. Exactly. And diving into these more, right? Because we did say from pen test to red teaming. Uh, and Dave, actually, when I was at Citigroup, we were doing pen testing. We weren't red teaming yet. It was our first hire to come in and, and build this. And back then, we were calling it end-to-end -end testing, which... Uh, you know, the Lockheed Martin kill chain had come on and we have a slide on that, but it was the full scope, right? It wasn't an assumed breach. It was literally us being on the outside, trying to get in and 
make it all the way to the objective before the blue team caught us and got us out. Um, and a lot of that comes down to scope, right? Yes, you can have a pen test that says the entire company is in scope, right? But it's very rare. Um, as an example, PCI DSS, right? The requirement from the pay part, payment card industry to do pen testing limits the scope in the regulation itself, right? Um, and that's kind of what we saw in the industry. It was a lot of focused pen tests, particularly on apps, like, hey, this is the app, this is the URL, these are the IPs. Um, you know, even if you got SQL injection, you had access to the backend database, you can now move laterally, be like, no, you can't. Um, you need to show the risk up to that point, and, and that's it. Um, so that's a big difference here. It's generally on these red team engagements. Of course, always check the scope, always check the rules of engagement, but we're going to be holistically testing the entire organization. When I say that, I'm not just saying like the web apps and the technology, but also the people and process. The other item is that red team engagements are stout. They are meant to be quiet and they're meant to be zero knowledge. Obviously, there's some people in the organization that are going to know it. We call them trusted agents. And of course, we go into that in this course. Um, but if a defender knows that you're coming and it's an exercise, they're going to act a little different. So those are some other uh, changes here. Um, on biases, I think Dave already touched on this a bit, right, is you have all of these biases as a person, whether you want to or not. And even when you're building a red team, right, let's say you're working at a corporation, you're building a red team for the first time or rebuilding a red team, which seems to be the theme lately, um, that team that you hire will also have biases. That's why you want a diverse team, a diverse way of thinking um, and whatnot, right? You have these assumptions. You don't want to take these mental shortcuts. You want to think through them. So we go deeper into this. I don't know, Dave, if you want to add anything, I think you did a good intro already. Yeah, I think even when you're, most specifically when you're building an internal red team is being able to put aside uh, the knowledge you have from your day-to-day -day job and your regular daily functions when you're, really moving to do a red team exercise at that point and really being able to separate the actions you're taking from what you actually know so that you can realistically emulate the threat that you're trying to emulate at that point uh, and being able to know, well, if I do this, I'm going to trigger an alert that's going to go off. But just that separation and being able to demonstrate it is going to be very key. Yeah. Um and then another big one is like what we measure, right? In a pen test, you find a vulnerability and it's binary, right? It's like it's open or it's closed, right? And you use CVSS to give it a score, uh, the common vulnerability scoring system, right? It could be a low, a medium, a high, or a critical, or you might have other uh, levels in your organization. In red teaming, sure, you can find issues and technology, which you can track the way I mentioned, but we start tracking other things, right? We start tracking time. We start tracking if a particular TTP, tactic, technique, or procedure had uh, a detection, had a log, had telemetry. If the red, if the blue team saw that alert and then actioned it and took action on it and then actually followed up and communicated well with the response team to then go and you know create an incident response case. And through all of that, there's time involved, right? You see a lot of metrics on the blue team side around mean time to detect, mean time to contain, mean time to eradicate. All of those are things that you start testing. So it's that shift from technology to testing people in process. And that's what we mean uh, with those. I think the assumptions we've uh, we 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 have quite a bit right. Trust but verify. We used to say this back in uh, the 2010s. Now zero trust is a thing, uh, which essentially says the same thing, right? And all these assumptions, right? Not wanting to call anyone out, but a lot of people saw you know that Sony breach of they stole how many terabytes of movies? Well, you can't exfiltrate that much from here without us knowing. Or can you? I don't know. We got to test it, right? And then training and improving the blue team. You want to take this one? 
Yeah, so really this is what our overall goal is, is to improve the blue team as well. So being able to come out at the end and being able to share some of the lessons that are learned, and that's going to be on both the blue side and the red side at that point, and both teams being able to evolve and do better based on uh, the engagement that you're wrapping up at that time. Uh, being able then to start training and practice. I know every time we're doing a red team engagement for a client, we actually build out a mock lab uh, that mimics their environment based on the OSINT that we've done as close as possible. So we can test everything out first before we do it, uh, as well as any new attacks that are coming out there and different ways of escalating permissions. Uh, what was it? Uh, BSC 13 just came out, a new ADCS. So spinning up a lab at that point, go and test it out. See if you're able to leverage it at that point. Being able to do it uh, hands-on keyboard with, say, a VM that you're using to pen test, but then transitioning that over and starting to do that through a C2 are going to be different skills and different things you have to learn. Uh, but as you're doing that, you want to start logging everything, being able to note when you ran something, uh, when you were able to then, say, escalate your permissions in the environment. Did you lose access? And keep track of that. A tip is have an easy log to keep track of it. So when you get the questions from uh, either the client or internally, uh, from your trusted agent, is this you? You can easily go and reference your log if it's a spreadsheet or another place where you're tracking it so that you don't have to go and start pulling out your C2 logs to be able to get access to it. Keeping it easy and handy is going to be very valuable. Um, and then being able to put all those things together at the end and getting to the report because the report's really what's going to matter in the end and what you're going to be delivering as the as the result. Yeah, that's a good point. I tell uh, my red team, right? It's like, You've done all this work. I know you did this work because I joined your weekly meetings and I see the sit reps, but our customer, most of them are internal. All they're going to get is that report, you know? So uh, how you deliver that is very important because that's what you're going to be judged on. That's what people are going to remember. But yeah, we're not going to go into reporting. Um, we're just going to touch on that last bit of differences here in pen testing and Red teaming, and that is the focus on stealth and testing detection response. How many of you have done a pen test? I'm seeing like a whole bunch of you raise your hands. How many of those, what percentage of those were announced? How many of those did you go and you tell the SOC like, hey, this, uh, we're doing this test. This is the IP I'm coming from. These are my proxies. This is my burp, uh, you know, relay, et cetera and they don't bother you. You go, you do all the tests, you're as loud as you want, because you're focused on finding vulnerabilities in technology, right? It happens a lot. It's the most, it's the, probably the biggest, uh, the, the most types of pen tests you do. In red teaming, you are trying not to get caught, right? You're not gonna run a vulnerability scanner. You're not going to even do password, uh, you know, brute force password guesses. You'll probably maybe do some password spraying, but do it very quietly, very slow, because you don't want to get caught, right? So a big difference here, well, knowing your tools, obviously your pen testers, please know your tools. Don't run that expo you found on GitHub without knowing what it does. Um, but not only knowing like what the tool does, but what it leaves behind. So you have to run this against, you know, in your lab and see what telemetry you're leaving behind, see what you're touching, because everything you touch is an opportunity for the blue team to catch you. And then at the end, if you weren't caught, you need to provide all those indicators of compromise. Let them know exactly what you did so they can go and hunt for it and then hopefully build detections for it, right? It's improving them. And then a big, big section on operational security we're going to touch just a little bit on that uh, in a little bit. But uh, but yeah, all these are things to keep in mind that are like the obvious differences between pen testing and um, and red teaming. So at the end of each section, as I mentioned, we have these mind maps where we cover motivation. You stop at, uh, start at the top right. Motivation uh, for red teaming, holistic view of an organization, going against those biases, testing people, process and technology, assumption, improved team, and focusing on stealth. Anything you want to add there, Dave, before we jump into the main event, which is frameworks? No. All good? good? All right. So frameworks and methodologies. This is not the most fun section, but it might be the most important one. Some of you 
want to get into red teaming in your organization, your corporate environment. You want to be an enterprise red team. Some of you, like Dave, might be uh, looking for clients or like Dave, have clients looking for you to do tests, to do red team engagements. And, you know, if you go to Dave and say, hey, I want a red team, obviously, you know, Dave and Nuvik and what they're doing. But if you didn't, you'd want them to have some sort of methodology, some sort of framework, some sort of process they're going to follow, right? They're not just going to come in and do the YOLO red team of, I have no idea what you're doing. And, you know, a month and a half from now, you're going to come back with a report. That's, it's not ideal. So in this section, we're going to cover industry frameworks, regulatory frameworks, and then the framework that we use uh, here in this course. So what do we leverage for industry frameworks? These are the ones that were created by the industry or a vendor. I guess Lockheed Martin falls under that first one. Uh, the cyber kill chain. This, yes, it's only seven, one, seven uh, objectives. We'll cover them. But this is all we had back in the day. Like when Dave and I started red teaming and doing a little bit of adversary emulation, like that is all we had. It was before MITRE attack, which you know nowadays is, is the main one. Um, <clears throat> but that's all we had. So it was a great start. Uh, and of course, Lockheed Martin owns that one and, and you have to pay them every time you say it. Uh, Paul Poles, uh, who's a great guy, he's on Twitter, uh, also likes Formula One like I do. He came out when he was doing his thesis in the university, put out the unified cyber kill chain, which actually took the Lockheed Martin one. And after the Lockheed Martin one, there were a bunch of other vendors that came out, like Dell SecureWorks came out with theirs, and Attack was starting to get famous, right? So he put them all together. That's another framework you can use. Of course, MITRE ATT&CK, we're going to talk about that one. Those three are all about understanding how the adversary worked. And then the Purple Team Exercise Framework is more for purple teaming, but you can easily modify it for stealth testing. Um, and that one, again, it's industry. It's open. Anyone can take it. You can modify it as long as you give credit, right? There's licensing and all that. So those are the ones we're going to dive into. So we have the frameworks are about understanding your adversary. If we're going to emulate an adversary, you have to understand it, right? So those are going to be your first three. And then we have the frameworks that help us actually um, plan and execute a red team engagement or an adversary uh, emulation. So first off, the cyber kill chain. This is Lockheed Martin. Um, and yes, we did change it. We we made it a little prettier. Uh, this is a shout out to Eric Van Bugenop from uh, Invisio and author of 599 and 699. So I did not do these images, but they're a lot better in my opinion. Um, you can see here, these are seven steps that threat actors use, that adversaries use. And you might find that there's some things missing, right? So an attack occurs, this was back 2013. What did they do? Well, they, they did reconnaissance. They gathered information about us on LinkedIn. Then they weaponized, created these payloads that they were gonna use against us. And they delivered those payloads through email, you know, through a macro, whatever it is. And then when we opened it, they exploited the person or, some, you know, word, ode, whatever it is, that's exploitation. And the exploit takes advantage of the vulnerability, the vulner the, and then it drops the payload. The payload is what happens next, right? You're familiar with Metasploit, right? Those are your payloads, your meterpreter, everyone's favorite reverse shell, right? And that meterpreter gives you this command and control, right? Very pen testy, but if you're coming from pen testing, that's why we're doing that. And then, from having C2, you then do action on objectives. Right? Just like that, very quick. Um, I can actually tell you, and Dave, you remember this, son. I think there was only one red team ever. I don't know, you might have done more now, where you all did so much recon and so focused testing that you actually met the action on objectives on the machine you got your C2 on. Do you remember that? 
Yeah, that was definitely uh, things worked out well for that one. Just getting access right away and being able to achieve the full objective of what we were sent in to do just by doing the recon and picking the right targets at that point. Yeah, I, I think that that was a uh, an energy. Uh, yeah, because in finance, we, we work in finance and you can trade energy. <laughs> and our, our objectives was to, to find out information about this energy trade before it happens, because then, of course, you have like insider information and you can make money on that. Um, and it was what they were they were going to go speak at a conference and you all acted like you were the the logistics person for the conference and sent a template to them. And that template was weaponized. Right. Was that the one? Yep, that was it. Uh, oh, man. Good times. The but the, the, the point is that one time, right? Dave's done way more red team than I have nowadays. But, you know, let's say he's done a thousand. Um, one is is very low, right? So cyber kill chain is cool, but there's gaps. Paul Paul, shout out to him. The unified cyber kill chain. And shout out to doing better graphics. Because when this paper originally came out, it was not this pretty three circular way, right? Uh, it was a lot harder to read, but essentially it breaks down a, an adversary attack in three, getting in, going through the environment and getting out. But you can see, hopefully you can see there, if you zoom in, uh, getting in covers reconnaissance, it covers weaponization, delivery, social engineering, exploitation, persistence, defensive agent, and command and control. Then it covers pivoting to a bunch of other systems, which is normally what you have to do. And you don't want to pivot to every system because, again, every system you touch is an opportunity to get for them to catch you. And then there you have a bunch of other tactics, discovery, privilege escalation, execution, credential access, lateral movement, and then your action on objectives, which are collection, exfiltration, and impact, which makes you meet the objective. So... This one uh, has a new website, has some nice new graphics. And again, shout out to Paul Poles for bringing together all these frameworks into one. And again, this is a course where we're not telling you use this one framework. We're giving you the options and we are going to use all of them so that you can learn whichever way that you want. And then MITER attack. No one's heard of this one, right? I remember back in the day when attack was new, we're like, this is really good. But it was hard for people to understand why this was good. Um, and now it's the standard, right? Adversary tactics, techniques, and common knowledge, really a common language that allows a red teamer to speak with cyber threat intel, to speak with incident response, to speak with the SOC. It's broken up in tactics, which are the adversary goals, high-level goals, the techniques, how they achieve those goals, and then the procedure, which is how to actually perform that. Now, in the procedures, they're not that focused. Um, it really focuses more on techniques, right? I think the numbers up at the 600s uh, today. And here's our mandatory MITRE attack matrix map that, again, if we don't put this in a red team talk, we actually get fined by MITRE. Uh, Dave, is there anything you want to say about attack? No, I think it, it's nice to use attack and then being able to go as you're planning out your adversary emulation as well and being able to go do your OSINT, your research and pull out. And a lot of them are mapped already by MITRE that you can go and start pulling those things out to organize the data for you ahead of time. So it's really helpful to be able to really understand it, master it, and know what data is where, where to go looking for what, and just getting used to going through it on a regular basis. So something we take a look at quite often. Yeah, like the data sources, that's something newer, right? From when this came out, this came out like 2015, 2016. Um, but now there's stuff and this is actively being worked on. The data sources are great because you can say, look, I did, I don't know, T0, whatever, 3.3 3, um, on a window system. And a defender can look at that, look at the data sources and know what telemetry they need to then build alerts to get catch you next time you go. And of course, being a red teamer, you have to understand about defense, but if you can point to an industry knowledge base, uh, it's always a lot nicer. So those are all about understanding what the adversary did so that you can then emulate. 
we put out the Purple Team Exercise Framework. And this is available on GitHub. I released version three at RSA last year. So it's not even a year old um, at this point, at least version three is not a year old. Um, and always open for contributions. So anyone that does want to contribute, please go in and do so. This is focused very adversary emulation because it covers cyber threat intel. Figure out what threat actor you want to emulate the prepping for an actual exercise, the execution of the exercise, and then the lessons learned. Um, and this is Purple Team, so it's collaborative. You can totally take this, modify it, and say, this is gonna be for stealth. Now, if you do wanna use a Red Team one, oh boy, oh boy, do we have Red Team uh, frameworks. Now, if you're in the United States, none of these apply to you. If you only operate in the United States, none of these apply to you. Isn't that wild? Most of these are required by other countries. So if you're in England, you have the Bank of England. So you have to be in England and a financial and the Bank of England regulates you and they make you do what's called CBEST. So this is one regulatory requirement. And of course, it's essentially an Intel-led, uh, it's, it's essentially an adversary emulation. If you are in the European Union, because obviously England doesn't want to be a part of that, um, you have Tiber EU. This is threat intelligence-based ethical red teaming. That's what Tiber stands for. By the way, CBEST does not stand for anything. I spent like a day Googling this and couldn't find it. It doesn't stand for anything. Then uh, Singapore. If you've ever operated there, we had a big team in Singapore, lots of great talent over there. Um, they have their own. Hong Kong has their own. Saudi Arabia has their own. The one that's missing from here is Australia has one. And actually Australia asked you to take this course as a way to say that you're certified for this. And we'll talk about some of those. Um, and then if you work in the finance space like Dave and I did, we didn't want to do one of these every year for every regulator that regulated us. And, you know, we worked at city. So that operated in what, like 160 countries. Imagine if each of them wanted you to do one full end to end red team engagement every year. Like we would just be doing this nonstop. Um, so we put one together. Now, a lot of these are very similar but these countries want to show how sovereign they are and they put out their own one. So we're going to go over those and then we're going to get into command and control. So I'm going to go relatively quick. Stop me if you need to, uh, Dave. The first one was CBEST. This was the first one we saw that hit our radar. They're currently on version two. And that came because the Bank of England wanted to regulate and make sure that all their large financials were up to par. And you'll see a lot of these uh, regulations, they're going to know the findings. And then they'll come up with what's called thematic findings, which like, all of you had this issue, focus on this. They have multiple stakeholders, the participant organization, the bank generally, the regulator, the England sector cybersecurity team, which was a third party, not the regulator. It's weird. Then the threat intel provider that's going to give you threat intel about what adversary is going to attack you, and then the actual provider. And then they divided this into four set uh, phases. What they call initiation, also known as preparation, threat intel, where they get the threat intel, the actual testing, and in this case, they called it pen test. I don't know if they still call it pen testing. And then the closure. And you did have to go to a third party. The third party has to be CBEST certified. There's a uh, another thing called Crest. I won't get into that, um, but yes, that exists. Um, then Tiber EU, it's a central framework for all of EU, and then each country in the EU has their own Tiber. And again, the phases are very similar. Generic uh, threat landscape, so that's threat intel, preparation, testing, and closure. Literally the same thing. They do have a trusted agent guidance, which I liked a lot. Those are the people in your organization and the target organization that know about your red team engagement. Um, and Singapore, Singapore was fun. 
because uh, they'd always ask us what we were doing and we were always doing some stuff that wasn't required. Like our, we started doing fishing back in like 2012. Um, and they came and they asked like, hey, show us your process. So it was like, we thought we were getting, you know, audited, but instead they were just learning what the requirements were. And then the next year they made all the banks do this based on what we showed them. So it was interesting. Um, we share them for, well, a city where they shared information. And the difference on this one is that there is a joint replay at the end, something that we call purple teaming today. Um, Hong Kong, they also very similar, came out with their own one. They did allow for self-testing. I don't know if that's still accurate today, but it was four years ago when I was still there, um, which is nice. You just have to prove that the testing team is not the same team that's in the blue team or that's in operations. And then we looked at each other and we're like, we can't do this. We need to like just come up with one framework that covers everything. Dave and I were actually authors of this. We worked with a bunch of other financials. Uh, GFMA stands for Global Financial Markets Association. And we came out with one which covers threat intel, planning, testing, and analysis and response. So after all that, what happened? Mandatory XKCD, right? There's Everyone 14 competing yeah. standards. What? 14? That's ridiculous. Why don't we come up with one universal standard? Great idea. Let's get to work. Six months later, so what happened? Now there are 15 competing standards. So um, because there were already 15, we decided to add a 16, and that is the framework for SEC 565. Very similar to GFMA and all the regulatory ones and even the Purple Team Exercise Framework. Threat Intel, learn about the adversaries that are attacking your organization, then plan a engagement, roles, uh, roles and responsibilities, right? What time, communication plan, all things we cover on this course. Then execution, that's where you go through and you emulate the adversary. And then closure, that involves doing a response and analysis workshop with the blue team. Like, hey, this is what the, we did. What did you do? Oh, and then overlap them. And then you work on the report. And we actually did map SEC 565 with MITRE ATT&CK. So if you want to learn ATT&CK in any particular order, you can see here, you know, like day one covers reconnaissance, day two covers resource development and command and control, day three covers initial access, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is a quick uh, recap of what we just covered. And now we get to command and control, which Dave, I'll hand it over to you so I can drink some water. And let's yeah. talk about a little C2, because I feel like that's like one of the things that differentiated us, like the move from uh, uh, an exploit framework like Metasploit and Core Impact and Canvas to like actual C2, right? Yeah, and using a C2 and being able to leverage it is one of the things now that's really being that differentiator, like you were saying, between a pen test team and coming in as a red team at that point. Although you may end up seeing sometimes C2 used during a pen test engagement, but uh, really different in that case because you don't need to worry about it being discovered or identified. Uh, but learning how to get in, set up C2, being able to configure it, how you actually have comms going back and forth. Uh, the different C2s that you have, short haul, long haul, being able to really understand that, set it up, configure it, uh, definitely takes a lot of time to go in there and learn it and really becomes an art in the end as well, too, depending on how much effort you really want to put in. Uh, and then you've even got C3 these days as well, jumping in using other platforms to run your current C2 over at that point. So being able to route things through whether it's Teams or Slack, and being able to use that as the communication platform to blend in. Uh, so being able to really understand and get set up is going to be huge and one of those things that you're going to need to overcome to go from pen testing to red teaming. So uh, command and control, it is the... It is my favorite tactic in, in MITRE ATT&CK. Uh, I have a little project called C2 Matrix, if you haven't seen it. It tracks a lot of these command control frameworks, but from like the easiest method possible, you have a target over here on the left and you somehow gained access to it, right? Pick your poison. Once the payload executes, 
it then calls out to a C2 server. Now it shouldn't actually call out to a C2 server. I'm gonna change this. I'm gonna add a redirector here. But like I said, this is the simplest way of doing it. And you can have your C2 server over here on the right. In this case, it's a screenshot of Empire. This is an old, uh, old version, but I love it because I once ran a command, uh, a CTF, and I actually had 457 active agents connected to my one C2 server. And it took a, like a champ. Uh, that was a big differentiator from my core impact. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember David Viewer at City when we did, uh, we did a dry deck simulation. We put a core impact payload into a word doc uh, via macro and sent it to like a thousand people. It was our first like emulation, first time doing phishing way long time ago. I, Empire didn't even exist. And so many people fell for it. It was like 250 people, which is only like 25%. But Core Impact did not handle that well. It could not get 20, uh, 250 uh, connections coming in, which most of your modern C2s can. So let's jump a little deeper into how C2s work. Dave, can you tell us what listeners are? Yeah, so the listeners is going to be what you actually have listening, running on your C2 server. So it's going to be... It's actually sitting there waiting for those callbacks to come in uh, and it may be routed through and it should be routed through a redirector at that point before it actually hits the listener that's actually running on your C2 server. So it's what's going to actually be having, think of like your regular web server out there that's running, accepting those connections, processing them, sending the response back down at that point. And it could be over a number of different channels. It could be where most commonly think of HTTP or HTTPS for using the comms. But we have other options out there. DNS can be used as well. That's something that can very well blend in in a lot of environments, but is very slow as well. Uh, and then we have others like TCP and SMB direct connections once you're inside a network uh, to be able to make those direct connections from one to the other and move laterally from one host to another without having all of them calling back directly out to the internet at that point. So being able to understand that and being able to leverage them depending on what it is, where you need to go throughout the environment as well. Uh, there are also other examples out there that you can use. And we were talking to some before C3, whether you're using Gmail, uh, you can use Outlook as well, maybe drafting emails in your draft folder and then the other system pulls it down, putting things through Slack. There's Twitter. What was it? Uh, that fake Britney Spears account, I think it was uh, a while ago that was being used on Twitter uh, for C2 traffic. And then y'all, latest ones, DNS over HTTPS, being able to use that now uh, for comms as well to be able to keep it from getting caught at that point. It's just the options are really endless, especially as we're changing uh, what tools we're using and going more to the cloud, adapting to the new cloud protocols that are out there, being able to blend in even more. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a ton of these, uh, like we mentioned, right? If you want to check out c2matrix.com, uh, the c2matrix.com, there's a ton of these. But let's talk more about operational security when it comes to C2. Um, again, we're not just putting our C2 server out there and using that for everything. We want to tier it out. Let's talk about the tiers and, uh, and which one relate to like a pen tester, right? If you use Metasploit and you just have a Meterpreter shell, that would be considered something like a tier three. It's an interactive, almost an ongoing connection, right? Depending on what protocol you chose. Uh, if it's HTTP, obviously it's not ongoing. Um, but that's interactive. Can you jump into uh, tier two, tier one, and then some of the rules uh, for this, Dave? Yes. So uh, tier three is going to be what you're using for your regular ops, uh, sending commands back and forth. Then we start getting to, into tier two, which is going to be that short term that calls back uh, longer than your interactive one. So maybe it calls back every couple of hours. Uh, and then you get into your long haul as well, which that's going to be calling back even less at that point. So maybe that's one's calling back once every 24 hours from a system or once every 48 hours, depending on what you are actually uh, setting up and who you're emulating. Uh, and that's really for uh, maintaining your access into the environment and having different callbacks to different endpoints out on the internet to be able to really maintain it. Uh, and you really want to use each one specifically for its purpose. You don't want to start crossing the streams uh, and start using your tier one to become interactive are uh, using your tier tier three to become your long haul because the chances of them being discovered at that point uh, go up considerably at that point. 
and you want to go off and start handing them off. So you would use your tier one to maybe then kick off the tier two and then tier two to kick off tier three uh, and perhaps use them on different systems as well. Uh, because the more you're using them and the faster that they're checking in, the higher the chance, as we have here, of them actually being detected at that point by the blue team and ending your engagement early once you lose all of your access. So being able to set that up, get profiles in place so that you know what the traffic's going to look like. You don't want all of them looking the same. Otherwise, if you have them all the same, really easy to get caught at that point. So really understanding it and being able to put your knowledge to test, uh, being able to really blend in with regular traffic. Yeah, and blending in, I think, is the important one, right? Like in the previous slide, we were talking about, you know, Gmail or Google Drive. You would probably want something like that against a, a, a company that uses Google Workspace. Uh, if that company uses Microsoft stuff, right? It's a Microsoft shop, then the Outlook one, right? Or if they use Slack, using the Slack uh, method, et cetera. A um, little bit more on long haul versus short haul um, and how to set it up, right? Obviously, we're not people. Uh, interactive is going to be the quickest. You're going to type uh, your commands and you're going to get a response very quick. That's ideal for you. That's not ideal for you being stealthy. Um, hopefully you get caught with this, but again, uh, you're testing them. If this doesn't get caught, then, then yeah, they have work to do. Um, short haul, smaller between uh, an hour to 24 hours and then long haul, much greater than 24 hours and mix and match those protocols, right? Like maybe it could be DNS for the long haul um, just to get you back that short haul C2 um, because you also don't want those on the same systems. You don't want those communicating to the same redirectors and things like that. Um, and just looking at the time here, I'm gonna get into more functional segregation. Or you wanna talk about this, Dave? Dave is probably like the best attack infrastructure person I know. Uh, and setting these up <laughs> and automating how to set these up. But setting up email servers is not that easy, is it, Dave? <laughs> no, I've been down the route of setting up and running my own mail server for this. Uh, do not recommend these days. Go out there, take a look at some of those cloud services, make sure you're not violating any of the terms when you're going to do so. Uh, but take a look at what's out there. It's easier to use services that you can sign up for, get it spun up quickly. Uh, and being able to have reputation versus having to plan it out and run it further ahead of time yourself. Uh, so something definitely to get under your belt, be able to learn how to set it up and even more fun coming these days, depending on where you're sending your fishes with Google and Yahoo's changes for DKIM and DMARC records. So just even more to handle from setting up infrastructure and things you wouldn't think you might have to deal with. Uh, and then being able to have multiple fallbacks in case one of them gets burned at that point, you never want to have that single point of failure, but you'll need these for the, your engagements, especially if you're doing social engineering, like fishing for getting initial access, because we know that's what most popular these days still for getting access into environments. Yeah. And I, resilience is important, right? Like we saw a lock bit, right? Great work by all the law enforcement that, that took them out. But essentially, they were running PHP servers with like keys on that same server and like no redundancy whatsoever that their whole infrastructure is just taken over because of that one PHP vulnerability. Same is true here. Like the point of what you're doing is eventually to get caught, right? Of course, you're wanna, gonna, you want to get to your objective without getting caught, but it's going to happen. And you don't want to get caught and then have to go set all this up again. As you build it in your planning phase, you want to have all these set up ahead of time. That way, when one gets burned and they start doing their incident response, they're not connecting those dots with, say, your long-term C2 or with your email infrastructure or the domains there, et cetera. I remember we once had a third party doing one of these. I don't know if it was CBES or Tiber, uh, but our blue team, we had already been doing this for a while was pretty good. And they found what consulting company it was and then all the domains they had. And it wasn't even just our domains, all their clients based on the domains that they had registered. So um, keep that in mind, right? You're being way more like an attacker. And my last slide here is going to get my Steve Ballmer out. And that is redirectors, 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 redirectors. Say it with me. Redirectors, 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 redirectors. 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 Right. Yes. We cannot expose 
RC2 servers directly on the internet. Even if you have an ACL, do not. Always go through a redirector. Just this week or last week, I times uh, perception now, right? There was an empire vulnerability. Did you see that one, Dave? Uh, the folks from like Ace Responders, they uh, found a vulnerability on the empire server that allowed remote code execution, essentially a attacker to take over your C2 server. Imagine explaining that to a client. Um, sir, uh, we gained access. We had a couple uh, agents running, but another threat actor actually hacked us and hacked our C2 server and then they got access to all your stuff. Like, what? You're fired immediately. Go, do not pass calls straight to jail. Um, do not expose them, right? The vulnerability would be not a non-exploitable if you used a redirector. And a redirector is just that. When we go into all of this in the course, of course, we don't have so much time, but always use redirectors. You can use a dumb redirector or a smart redirector, whatever it is. Um, you can actually find a little bit more info on that on the c2matrix.com. Or if you take the course, we obviously go into all of this much deeper. But for today, we have run out of time. Hope you enjoyed this sans fire hose effect. Um, if you've never experienced, we have a few minutes left for some questions. Post them on, up here. Um, while you do that, I do want to read one. Shout out to you, Tyler Miller. Great question. Is C2 ever considered during the CTI phase for choosing which adversary to emulate? For example, if a threat actor uses, say, Sliver, is there an expectation for the red team to do the same? And the answer is yes. You will want to emulate the threat actor that is likely to target your target organization with as closely as possible. If it's something like Sliver, 100%. If it's anything in the C2 matrix, which is essentially public, open source, free, and or commercial, go for it. Where we draw the line, and again, this is up to you, is if a threat actor has their own custom C2, we're not gonna go and try to get that one um, through any means and then use that one. Instead, what we will use is again, on CTI and see how their C2 works, right? We see it's using HTTPS and it's sending the information through a cookie. We can find a C2 that does that, or we can modify our C2 to do that. And then yes, you will want to get as close as possible. So I answered that question there. I think we have some other ones. Um, let's go with this one, Dave. Should C2 infra be only hosted internally in cloud or IP tables with geo-blocking be sufficient? So for that one, that's there's going to be two answers here. And one the really biggest one is it's going to come down to your organization's risk appetite and what you're allowed to do. Maybe you have policies that prevent you from hosting it natively in the cloud uh, and you have to pull it back on prem. But there's controls you can get in place with it either way at that point. So whether it's IP tables, maybe you're hosting it in AWS using some of those firewall rules there. Uh, you can start using some other things out there like tail scales, a nice mesh VPN that you can use to get your management infrastructure and be able to reach all the nodes without exposing things directly to the internet. So there's other controls you can get in place there. Uh, and then you can only access it from a system that's connected to the VPN and you're only exposing redirectors at that point. So it's really going to come back though to that risk appetite and what you're allowed to do by policy for your organization. Uh, but even if you do have it in the cloud, you can have the encrypted VM so the disk is encrypted at rest and then maybe use uh, Linux in this case, but using a, an encrypted Lux container to go and mount it. So in case anyone ever got to your VM at that point, they'd have to have the keys to actually go and get the data that you have there. Uh, so there are a number of things to bring in from when you're designing the infrastructure and putting it out there that you can have as compensating controls if you are going to put it in the cloud. Awesome. Well... It looks like we are right getting to the top of the hour and we've answered all your questions. So thank you again for coming. We know your time is important. So we thank you for it. And if you have any questions, connect with us on Discord or on Twitter. Happy to keep this conversation going. Again, do you, if this stuff interests you, we have a whole six day class for it. Sec 565 with probably Dave or Jean-Francois. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.